Good morning, church. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 63, verse 4, So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. So let us all rise and let us praise him for who he is and lift his name on high. Yesterday, we had the couples fellowship, and we were blessed with, with the presence of those who came. I was blessed with those who were how, how six months in, in marriage, right? The, the, the youngest married couple who attended yesterday was six months, and the oldest was 54 years, and they're here. Thank you very much for, for uh, loving each other and loving God. So as we continue our study on, on Peter's letter to the persecuted church, as, as we wrap things up, Lord willing, next week will be our last message on this epistle, and it's, it's been wonderful. And I hope all of you ha have a good grasp of the context of the, this epistle, that this was written to a group of believers, believers in Christ who are being persecuted for their faith. In fact, they are dispersed. You know, just mentioning that phrase that these believers are being persecuted for their faith makes me think of what happened to a church in Texas just a few days ago. In fact, just a week ago. It was just a typical worship service at First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs in Texas. You know this, right? When a gun, when gunfire tore through the church, killing 26 people, injuring 20, and leaving a small town devastated. Among though the fatalities included 10 women, seven men, eight children, and the unborn fetus carried by one of the victims. The youngest of the victim was one year old. The oldest of the adults was 77 years old. As we listen, as we hear this news, things like this should not happen, right? But it has. In a church, in a small church, this was a closely knit family of believers. This was a group of people who loved the Lord, who loved each other. I was reading the article, and they said that the older people in that church, they were very well respected in the community. And the kids, they loved being in the church. The suspect, he had a history of domestic violence. He was armed with a Rudger assault-style rifle. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that looks like. Sounds scary, though. He was armed with a, an assault rifle and with two handguns. He left behind at least, listen, at least 15 empty magazines holding 30 rounds each. I say, imagine that, looking at the picture of the, the church, a very small church. He died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound when he couldn't escape those who were going after him. One couple who survived the attack said that the suspect went aisle by aisle through the pews and shot, listen, crying children at point blank. 
Listening to this breaks our heart. It is one thing to know that grown-ups were killed in that church. Kill babies? Shot, shoot children at point blank? Without hesitation? That is so hard to swallow. Right? But folks, that is the world that we live in. And as we contempl- contemplate on it, it is not impossible for these things to be happening to us right now. And even in this country. As I was reading the news article on the said event, I read a line and I just couldn't read on. As a lump on my throat made it hard to swallow. As it ripped my heart and it reads, listen. Among those who was killed was the 14-year-old daughter of the pastor of that church. I needed to pause. I needed to stop. What if that was my daughter, Yana? What if that was your daughter? What if that was your boy? But think for a moment. If that happens to us right now, how would we respond? Or better, how should we respond Some of you right now, as I mention this, as I read to you this article, would reject that thought and say, please don't say that. Please don't even mention that. It's hard to swallow. I'm here to be comforted. I'm here to just just be lifted up. I have all my, I have my, my struggles already. But you know what? As I grow older, I know that from the horizon, persecution will come. To me as an individual, to us as individuals, and as a corporate body. With all seriousness, I pray that my life, our body life, would just reflect trust and dependence on God even amidst such an attack. Even amidst such a violent attack. That is the concern of Peter as well. To the believers that he wrote to. Remember that as he wraps up this letter, persecution is ongoing and it will escalate according to history. In times of trouble, what does the church need? I think the passage before us tells us what we need as a church as we face trouble. What the church need in difficult situation was discussed here by the Apostle Peter. And listen, as we look into this beautiful section of passage, I hope we would really be listening to God. As we look at this passage, we'll be looking at five simple headings. And I pray, dear ones, that we would listen to God as he explains to us what the church needs in times of trouble. We need to be reminded that it is clear from Scripture. It is clear from Jesus Christ himself that there will be trouble. Again, I pray that those who have ears would truly be listening to God as we realize what the church needs in difficult situations. First of all, we'll be looking at, at, by way of review, the church needs in times of trouble highly biblical under-shepherds who are godly examples. And we have seen that in verse 1 to 4, when we, the last time we were together. In difficult situations, the church needs high regard for the elders. In difficult situations, the church needs humility toward one another. In times of trouble, the church needs humbleness towards God, and the church needs to put their hope in God's care. What do we need as a church in times of trouble? Highly biblical under-shepherds, high regard for the elders, humility toward one another, humbleness towards God, hope in God's care. Let's look at the first heading. And this is just a review since we discussed about this last week. The church needs highly biblical under-shepherds who are godly examples. Let me read to you verse um, 1 to 4 again. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion but willingly, 
as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, and it will be soon, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Listen, in difficult times, the church needs the elders to be shepherding the flock, to be feeding them nourishing truth, to not be entertaining them. They need to know about this, that trouble will come our way. They need something to keep them keeping on. And that is only found in the nourishing truth that we can find in Scripture. The, sh- the, 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 the elders should be protecting them over and from the enemy to be exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. Not for sordid gain or dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not lording over, not domineering, but rather to be an example of godliness because we know that when the chief shepherd appears, we will receive the unfading crown of glory. The elders, pastors, and overseers of the church need to man up and be the frontliners, a source of comfort and protection for the flock. For the flock of God delegated in their stewardship. Peter now goes on and addresses the congregation. We have seen what the elders ought to be doing for the church, what should be done by those who are members of the flock. Let's look at verse 5. They should have high regard for the elders. Look at verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Likewise, or in the same manner as the elders were addressed in the first four verses to shepherd the flock, the younger people now are being addressed, being encouraged to be subject to the same elders that he exhorted a while ago. Now, some commentaries say that this this does not refer to the elders of the church or the office of the elders, but referring to the older people in general in the church, that the younger generation is to be respectful to the elderly. And it does make sense for the younger generation to be respecting our senior. But as we look at verse 5, We should look at it as a bridge, if you may, that stretches both ways. The first section of verse 5 looks back to the first four verses. The second part of verse 5 looks forward, you see? So I believe, looking at the surrounding context, the immediate context before, it is referring to the office of the elders. It is referring to the elders, pastors, and overseers. The younger people are being encouraged to have high regard to the elders as they shepherd the flock, as they model godliness and holiness amid struggles. They are to be subject. Other renderings say to submit to the elders. That word subject or submit, that word is a military word. A military word that has a sense of urgency. You may wonder, why are they being addressed here? Why are the younger people being addressed? Are they being unruly? Or are they rebelling? We don't know for sure. But generally, generally, younger people tend to be impatient, impulsive, especially amidst difficult situations. So you see the heart of the apostle here. You see the heart of the shepherd. Peter in light of the persecution that is going on and will escalate, is encouraging the younger people to subject themselves to the elders. And as we remember, right, that that is one of the repeated themes in the epistle. Let me remind you, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 to 14, we read, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether it be to the emperor or as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. We jump to verse 18. We read chapter 2, verse 18 of 1 Peter. Servants, be 
subject to your masters with all respect. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 to 2. Likewise, in the same manner, wives be subject to your own husbands. So that even in, if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. You see, that is a repeated theme in this epistle. And I think we have dealt about that. But what does it mean to be subject again? What does submission mean? Simply put, submission is trust. As the elders were given an important task of shepherding the flock. And as we have seen last week, the qualifications for an elder is quite strict. As we understand that these elders, your leaders, would give an account to each one of you, even though you don't agree with us, kindly trust us. Kindly trust us. If you agree that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and we were given this noble task, an aspiration, a conviction to serve you, kindly trust us. You don't have to agree with us. Just trust us. Because we would give an account to each one of you. And that is a scary, scary truth. Listen, the elders of this church take this task seriously. Peter has beautifully encouraged and challenged the elders in the first four verses, didn't he? So Peter is saying, trust and listen to your leaders, to your pastors, to your overseers, young people. Though this is addressed in this verse, particularly to the younger people, this is not limited to the young people as we harmonize scripture. Listen to Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 to 13. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, over you in the Lord and what? Admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love. It is not easy for us to love those who admonish us, right? But trust us. To esteem them very highly in love because of their work, be at peace among yourselves. Hebrews 13, verse 7, we read, Remember your, your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. You see, I think the underlying theme of this section is what? Humility. Humility. Which leads us to our next setting. The church needs, in times of trouble, highly, biblically, highly biblical under-shepherds who are godly examples, and we need the young people to have high regard for their elders. And also, we need humility toward one another. Look at your Bibles again. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. As the elders, in humble submission to God's call, shepherd the flock, the congregation then should submit, should trust the Lord who has placed them where they are as leaders of the church. And everyone in the church should in, should in humility submit themselves to each other. Going back to the context of the epistle, friends, in times of trouble, in times of the fiery ordeal. We need each other to be a source of comfort and strength. We need to be united and be trusting one another. That is what Peter says here. All of you, everyone, regardless of age or class or gender, everyone in the church, clothe yourselves in humility toward one another. And that is a very beautiful picture here. 
Peter gives, listen, Peter gives us a vivid imagery. The word cloth or clothe in the Greek has a picture of tying up something to one's body. Usually this is used to refer to the apron of a slave that he wraps around his waist as he serves his master. Listen, in the church, there is a garment that we all should be putting on. And the good thing about it is it is one size fits all. It's not only for the younger people. It's not only for the men, the women. It's for everyone. We should be clothing ourselves in humility towards one another. We are to wrap ourselves with humility, you see. As we depend on each other, as we live together, as we trust one another, most especially in times of trouble. The word humility is a compound word. The root word is the word mind. Put the adjective low, then we have lowliness of mind or self-abasement. You need to understand, beloved, the word in itself is distinctly Christian. Why? No Greek writer, no Greek philosopher has used the word until Christianity came. That is staggering. It is our identification. Peter says to be low-minded toward one another. Now, before you jump into conclusion, this doesn't mean low esteem. Some would say, oh, see, your pastor is teaching us low esteem. And some of the proponents of the motivational speakers say, you need to boost the morale of the church. They need to have high esteem, but that is not what we see here, right? This doesn't say that low estimation of yourself. This is Christ's esteem. This is a proper estimation of oneself in light of Scripture, in light of what Christ has done. Remember when we were looking at Romans chapter 12 as a series, remember that? Remember Romans 12, verse 3? Let me read that to you. For the, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Listen. Humility does not mean that we Look down on ourselves, but look at ourselves with the right estimation. We should not have an exaggerated estimation of ourselves, but put ourselves in the right place to be looking at ourselves through the lens of Scripture, not by fallen culture. Clothing ourselves with humility is having the mind of Christ. Listen to Paul. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 8. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, but in humility, count others more significant than others. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Then he expounds, he explains, what, what did Jesus do? Okay, Paul, you're telling me to be humble and to have the mind of Christ. And what did he do? Who? though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. That is staggering. The eternal God emptied himself. The kenosis of Jesus Christ by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found 
in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Listen, to put on the apron of humility is to be like Christ. Now, I believe as Peter was writing this to the persecuted believer, and as he is encouraging them to be clothing themselves with humility, I believe he remembers what Jesus did when he put on an apron on his waist and started washing the disciples' feet. Setting for them an example to follow. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Look at verse 5 again. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. In light of the sufferings that they were facing, they were commanded to have a proper estimation of themselves and to regard others more significant than themselves. Have you ever wondered why? As I was looking at this, as, as I was reading this, I wonder why. We're facing persecution and you're telling me to not look at myself more highly than I ought to think? Why? And how do I do that? You see, beloved, in times of trouble, the tendency is to be thinking of oneself. And that is even for the believer, even for the redeemed. Someone who is facing such struggle may resort to pointing to people to find fault, to alleviate the pain, to blame others for the persecution. This is happening because sister so-and-so did this. No, this is happening because brother so-and-so did not do this. You see? In times of trouble, we need to have a proper estimation of oneself. Not looking at ourselves more highly than others. To be humble towards one another. How does one become humble then? Let me ask you three questions. I mean, I don't think it's three, but let me ask you these questions. Do we really know what's in the heart of a person? No, right? From time to time, we may think so, but we don't. Wives would sometimes say, I know what you're thinking to the husband, right? And she may be right, and she may also be wrong. If she's wrong, the husband will be frustrated. And if she's right, he will be more frustrated. (laughs) But the point is this, beloved. In reality, we can never be too sure of what is in the heart of a person until he puts it into action, right? However, there is a heart that we know pretty well. And that is our own heart. We know pretty well the sin in our own hearts. Therefore, according to first-hand information, who is the most wicked person that you know? Ah, Hitler. First-hand information. Who is the most wicked person that you know? Who has the most corrupt mind that you first-hand know? Honestly, you would have to say yourself. Since we have a first-hand knowledge of our own sinfulness, we shouldn't regard ourselves as better than others. Not only did Paul write about this, but this was his conviction. Listen to him as he explains and shows us this conviction. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, it reads, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Did you hear that? Let me read that to you again. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Present tense. And we're talking about Paul here. He did not say, of whom I was foremost. And you would say, Paul would probably be the best 
Christian who ever walked the planet. But he has a right estimation of himself. Listen, the believers need to have a right estimation of oneself in light of Christ as we serve one another, especially in times of trouble, to be the source of comfort, to be the source of encouragement, that though sin would come in, we would not look down on others. And Peter wanted to hammer this as he goes on and gives the readers and us today the motivation to be humble towards one another. Look at the end of verse 5 again. And he does this by quoting Proverbs 3.34. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. A stern warning to the proud and a promise to the lowly. Listen, what could be worse than a powerful God opposing you? What could be better than God being gracious to you? Listen, this is at times, this is a passage wherein at times we say, oh, I understand that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. In fact, James quoted the same Proverbs in saying, uh, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. This is where at times we may just, we may just be scratching the surface. It's plain and simple, so okay. The Almighty God is saying to Christians, I will oppose you if you have pride in your hearts. That is when you need to sit down and pause and start meditating and assess yourself. When things don't go right, when things go wrong in the home, at school, at work, even in the ministry, when you feel the weight of struggle, may, maybe, just, just maybe, maybe God is opposing you. Maybe there's pride in our hearts. Remember in the previous section, we learned that if we are to suffer, we should be suffering for the right reasons. And if we are suffering for the right reasons, remember that judgment of God can be a purifying agent. That's why he say. It is time for judgment to begin in the household of God. Maybe God is trying to wake us up. Maybe God is, show, is trying to show us the pride in our hearts. Maybe the reason why things are as they are is because God wants to tell us how proud we have become. Honestly, folks, we cannot just brush this off. We cannot just take this lightly. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So clothe yourselves with the humility toward one another. I could hear Peter saying, saying, pleading. You need to get this right, guys. This is crucial. This is important. You are being persecuted for your faith and you are suffering and you still have pride in your heart. You need to understand that humility towards others is actually a product of humility towards God. Take God out of the equation. There goes humility. And the alternative God would kick in and have the place and pride would reign. This admonition to be humble toward one another naturally highlights then the next admonition, and that is our next heading. In times of trouble, the church needs to be humble before God. Humility towards one another cannot be separated from humility towards God. Look at verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. The verb humble yourselves is in the passive voice. It is not in the active voice. You can't do this to yourselves, or you can't do this. So literally it reads, allow yourselves to be humbled, or be humbled under the mighty hand of God. You see? In other words, 
voluntarily accept the various trials you are facing, the hardships you are encountering as being under the mighty hand of God. Mighty hand of our sovereign God. The phrase mighty hand of God in the Old Testament can be used in reference to his dominion and in reference to his discipline. Humbly accept God's discipline and trust that he cares for you knowing that he will exalt you at the proper time. Listen, to a persecuted church going through a fiery ordeal as Peter's readers were, this was the advice and the assurance that they needed. That he who raised his son from the dead, who is now ascended unto heaven, seated on the right hand, given the name above all names, will give grace to those in Christ, will die to self in total dependence before him, even amidst persecution, and will be exalted at the proper time. Kindly note that God doesn't exalt us immediately. Peter says and informs us that God does it at the proper time. When is that proper time? I don't know. Ultimately, it will be in the eschaton where we see him face to face. When we are being We'll be exalted. We'll have glorified bodies, right? We'll be like Him. You know what? It can happen as well here on earth while we wait for Him. Remember Joseph, right? Joseph endured his trials in Egypt for more than 20 years before he was exalted by God to rule over Pharaoh's kingdom. 20 years. What has happened to you in 20 years? Five years. One month, have you paused and asked yourself, is there any pride in my heart? God will exalt his suffering child when in his infinite wisdom it is conducive to his glory and it is the true welfare of the one to be lifted up. Therefore, we must humbly exercise patience during times of trouble. And this is what Peter is saying here to this church. But you may say, how do you do that? How do you humble yourselves before God? How do you humbly exercise patience during struggles? Look at verse 7. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Listen, the NIV translation puts a period on verse 6, making verse 7 a new sentence. But that obscures the thought that Peter is trying to convey here. He's not saying humble yourselves and then cast all your cares upon Jesus. He's saying humble yourselves. That is the main verb. And in casting all your cares is the participle amplifying the verb. What Peter is saying here is this. Humble yourselves by casting all your anxieties on him. You see? Casting your care on God is a humble response of a person who loves God who is facing struggles. It is an outward evidence that you have placed yourself under his mighty hand and that you trust him completely even when it hurts, even when you can't understand, even when it's taking so long. And you trust him because you know he cares for you. Again, that is a very familiar passage, right? We sing that. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all my burdens down at your feet. But you know what? I honestly think with the context in mind, I personally wouldn't understand this until I get there. There are just so many trials in life that is humanly impossible to go through. Humanly impossible to go through. And we've heard of stories like that. First Baptist Church in Texas. There is a mother or a father there who may be crying out 
that's my baby. That's my boy. But they're trusting God. I'm reminded of Joni Erickson Tada and Justin Peter who are living testimonies of a someone who puts his trust and casting all his their cares on, on, on Jesus alone. They were disabled. They wanted to get well, but God saw it best for them to stay disabled for his utmost glory. Somebody you may know who is a faithful follower of God may have found out that he or she has cancer. And the first thing that we say is, why of all people, this brother, this sister? But some of these brethren, in spite of the confusion, are casting their cares humbly upon Jesus because they know that he cares. That in the proper time, maybe in their lifetime, perhaps in the eschaton when he comes back, he will exalt them because he trusts that they trust in him. Listen, that is a hard thing to do. Right? But if you see someone going through that, that gives glory to God. Right? What does it mean to cast our anxieties on him as we go through struggles? Let me read to you Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpass all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Listen, anxieties and worries are the result of pride and dependence on self. Blessing and peace, on the other hand, are results of humility and dependence on God. In time of need, a self-reliant heart finds little grace. But in time of need, a humble heart finds much grace. What the church needs in times of trouble is not entertainment. The church needs under shepherds who would care for them who would shepherd them and protect them. In times of trouble, the church needs humility from the younger people as they have high regard for the elders. In times of need, the church needs humility toward one another as they clothe themselves with humility because they know that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. In times of trouble, the church needs humility towards God because knowing that He has the mighty hand in times of need, the church needs to put their hope in God's care, casting in total abandon all our anxieties on him because we know that he cares for us. Listen, to sum it all up, the church need in times of trouble what the church need in times of trouble are humility towards God that would translate into humility towards one another and dependence on his mighty hand. I pray that as we anticipate, again, over the horizon, persecution will come. And I pray that we would, as a body and as individual believers, would showcase dependence on God because we know he cares. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. And I pray that those who have ears have truly listened and would heed to your call to trust in you ever regardless. We thank you. We love you. This is our prayer with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.